preach from behind the pulpit here because that's where I normally I do. I feel safer always behind a pulpit and you never know who's maybe got something prepared for you so it's just I think a psychological thing but it's good to be here and to share God's word tonight and truly it is very warm. I really feel the, feel the heat here tonight but nevertheless we're all right. Lovely to be back. I think it's about a year. Jim was saying maybe it's a couple of years since I was with you here. Um, I was off at the start of the year right through because of the old COVID thing. But thank God I've made a good recovery. It was many people didn't, but uh, I did. And I'm very, very grateful uh, to the Lord for that. I was talking to a doctor. I was in the hospital for a while with it and come out. I'd been ill for two or three weeks before really I thought I had a bad flu just and didn't bother with these tests and all. And uh, I was talking to a doctor. He came to see me for a prayer about um, a month or two afterwards, whenever I was feeling a bit better to pray with people. And he came and we were chatting. And he worked down in, uh, I think it was the city. He was he was probably a specialist. And um, so we chatted a wee while before I prayed with him. And he says to me, do you know if you'd have had another two or three days like that, I don't think you'd be with us. So that was good news. <laughs> Good news, it was well the Lord was at his hand. Thank you very much, Jim. It's well the Lord at his hand on me. You're singing there about the Lord's faithfulness. I was just thinking about it whenever there was an old man, he went to be with the Lord two or three years ago, but he, he was 107, I think, when he died. A friend of mine, and uh, he was at my wedding and all, but he uh, he got saved when he was, I think, six. So he was saved just over 100 years, and uh, it was quite an achievement, isn't it? Saved 100 years. Uh, but anyway, Leonard Ravenhill, some of you might have heard of Leonard Ravenhill. Well, his son's called David Ravenhill. He's an older man now, but David Ravenhill went to see him in, uh, in a home where he was. And he was, a, he was a, a very wise old man. And he still had all his faculties at 104 or 5 at the time. So he said to this old man, he says, um, what age were you when you got saved? He said, I was about six. He says, I suppose you hardly knew what you were doing when you got saved. He says, no, I didn't, but God knew what he was doing. (laughs) And you know, throughout life, sometimes we don't know what we're doing. But God knows what he's doing. And he's the one who has the final say. And if you're in his hand, you're safe. I'm going to read a few verses. Um, I don't want to be overly late with you tonight, for I know you are all probably in a kind of semi-relaxed state. So I don't want to put anybody to sleep on uh, or intentionally. Uh, we're going to turn to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. And we're going to read this short psalm. It's a beautiful psalm. Uh, yep, just in the middle of your Bible there, Psalm. And we're going to look at one or two of the verses in this Spend a little while over them together. Okay, Psalm 8, and we'll read from the verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth! Who has set thy glory above the heavens? Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider... The work of thy hands, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honour. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Now jump over to me, with me to the last book of the Bible and then take a right, and you'll get one little chapter called the book of Jude. The little book of Jude. And we're going to <clears throat> just read two verses there. Jude and verse 6. And verse 7, Jude 6, 
and 7. And here Jude, speaking, says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains, under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. This refers to the time of Genesis 6, when what we call the Nephilim, or the giants, were born. When the angels, who were watchers, who were given specific responsibility to watch the affairs of men, decided to overstep their calling. And they invaded upon the planet, and as a result they had intercourse with women, And the Bible tells us that then the giants were born. These hybrids, half human, half demon. And these creatures were born. And as a result, uh, God then intervened with the flood. But the Bible tells us about these angels, that they were put into a special place of judgment. It seems to me from both reading the Bible... And also those uh, that I've listened and read about over the years, people who have had unusual experiences of either having unique dreams that felt as though they literally left their body or whether they literally did, I can't tell that. But either way, uh, a number of them have uh, related, and not only in recent times, but in fact, you remember John Bunyan who wrote the book Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan also had unique experiences of leaving his body and going to hell. And that's, of course, recorded. You can look that up and listen. I've listened to it before. Very alarming. Uh, but this, these things uh, have occurred. As I say, it's not just recent. It happened to John Bunyan. And uh, hell seems to have compartments. There seems to be different areas and different locations within it. And certainly the Bible seems to allude to that because of this place where the fallen angels are kept. It's called Tartarus in the original Greek. It's a, com- a particular compartment where they're presently, they're there just now, they are chained, the Bible says, and they're chained in this unique compartment of hell. And they're there until the judgment when God will finally deal with them. So that's what that really is alluding to there. Verse 7 is more familiar, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. That means unnatural. We have the whole issue of homosexuality uh, mentioned here. Strange flesh. It's the same concept, you see, um, if you read in the verse 6 that we mentioned about the angels having intercourse with men, that they stepped over the boundary that God had established. The angels and people were to be separate, but the angels invaded the human race sexually. That was stepping over the boundary. It was unnatural. It was not what God intended, and consequences came for it. So he's just he's just pushing the boat out a little further, and he says the same thing happened in Sodom and Gomorrah whenever people began to have relationships with the same sex, which was contrary to God's order. It was not what God wanted. And as a result, then it says they went after, uh, they give themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, and they are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. If you were to go to Sodom and Gomorrah or that region today, you will find, um, like, uh, people who, geologists or whatever you would call them, uh, uh, there's there's plenty of material, you could look it up on the internet, and you'll see that it's quite a unique location on the earth because it's covered in sulfur balls. There's nothing grows, absolutely nothing grows there. It's, it's absolutely covered in these little white balls, and they're sulfur. And uh, it seems to, I'm not saying that is it, but it seems to uh, add up to say that that's the location where the Lord poured out, and the Bible says he rained fire from heaven. And God said Sodom and Gomorrah was set forth as an example. God said, I have left the remnants of my judgment as a warning to every generation thereafter that I will not look kindly on when you go after strange flesh. God said there's consequences. And I know that that's not the end thing to say today. And I know that many um, indeed, Christians, people who are actually born again, have now shook on this issue simply because of the volume of pressure from society that they have decided to just give in and go with it. 
because they don't have answers. And let me just point out in, in passing, I didn't intend to say this, but let me point out something in passing. I have met lovely Christians and they've said to me or said to others that I, I know, and they've said, listen, some of these people who have these issues, and we have to have compassion. I mean, this is a real issue. There's people who are wrestling with this type of thing, and it drives some people to suicide. We have to understand that. That's that's terrible. But what we have to recognize is, is God right or is God wrong? Is the Bible right? Is the Bible wrong? Is it all to do with misinterpretation? What, what's the problem? And one of the great problems Christians have is they say, listen, we meet people and they say, from from the child was four or five, it, it, it began to have this behavior trait. And, and you know, nothing happened. The child wasn't raped. The child wasn't abused and, and it was in a good home. And, and then it grew up and this is the lifestyle. So obviously God made the child that way. Obviously. And Christians don't have an answer for that. But one of the beauties in the last 30 years of having more and more being involved in deliverance ministry and ministering to people who have issues in their own lives through the sin of their own lives, but also because of what their ancestors were involved in, that on numerous occasions I have come across people who were homosexual in their orientation and it went right back to childhood. But they inherited something from their ancestry. A bent, an iniquity. They didn't do anything to ha- to get it. It's just there. And it's because of an ancestral curse. And I have m- prayed with many homosexuals over the years. And this reoccurs over and over again. And so, dear friends, we need to recognize that. That when we say to society, oh no, we're going to love and we're just going to embrace all this. We're going to say this is fine because we love you. What you do is you condemn those people to hell. That's what you do. Whereas what you should do is what Jesus did with the woman that was taken in adultery. Jesus said, I don't condemn you. But I don't condone what you're doing either. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It's both. I don't condemn, but I won't condone. He said, go and sin no more. That needs to be the approach. Okay, let's get back to our message now. I've nearly a sermon preached there, and that's only introduction. Psalm 8. Somebody agreed with me there. That wasn't good. (laughs) Maybe you want me to sit down at this stage. Psalm 8. We're going to read just two verses. This beautiful psalm of the creative power, glory of God, and his power in creation. And it mentions the angels, it mentions the earth, so on and so forth. But we want to look at verse 4, where the psalmist says, What is man? That God is mindful of him. And the son of man that thou visitest him. And so our little message tonight is, what is man? What is man? What a question. What a question. What is man? Well, before we do that, let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your precious word. Thank you for the time of worship, Lord, and and just coming to Pour our hearts out to you, Lord. Now we ask for the help and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I give myself unreservedly to you. Everything I have, everything I ever hope to be in life, until my death, I voluntarily, gladly and willingly give it over to you. I pray that you will cleanse me and sanctify me and fill me with the Holy Spirit. Please minister, Lord, to every person who has made the effort to come here tonight. Don't let them go out, Lord, feeling empty. Don't let them go out feeling discouraged or dying. But I pray that the Holy Spirit will minister powerfully into their lives, wherever they are on the journey. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, what is man? Well, if we were to talk to psychologists today and psychiatrists and other clever people, they would simply tell us that man is nothing more than a body with a mind. 
That's the extent of who he is. He's just a body that, in many cases, the general view, certainly in the Western Europe, is that man has evolved from some kind of a blob way back in billions of years ago, and he managed to become as good and creative as he has, and that's just the answer. And that's the general view. By the way, by the way, in case you happen to be a person who wants to witness to people and win others to the Lord and you meet people and they blah, blah, say to you, well, we all evolved because that's the view of Western Europe. Let me tell you, the vast majority of the world, the vast majority of the world believe in God. So don't, don't be thinking you're in the minority if you believe in God. Now they believe in different gods and so on, but the vast majority of the world's population tonight believe there is supernatural powers over and above humanity. They believe that. And they're absolutely right, of course, because there's that instinct in us, isn't there, that there's God. We look at the world and we look at creation, we look at ourselves, and we are overwhelmed when we think about it to consider who made this all. This this certainly couldn't have come from a random explosion that it's so complex and that it works so intricately and the planets and, and, and just the right environment for human life and that, and that life works perfectly on it. You mean, it just is beyond belief that we could believe that it came from a bang. Is it any wonder God very simply deals with that attitude that's prevalent today? He doesn't give much time to it, really. He doesn't go into argument. God just steps back and said, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Just one adjective, God said, you're a fool. That's all I can say about you. The evidence is so overwhelming. Well, when we look at the body, there's some interesting things. And don't worry, this is not going to be a science lesson but or biology. But I want to point out just a few details for to latch onto your mind tonight about your body. You have enough vessels, blood vessels in your body to go around the earth twice. Just where you're sitting tonight. There's enough blood vessels in that body that you're using tonight to go around the planet connected twice. Every second, there are two million red blood cells made in your body. Every second, two million blood cells are created and made, and they go to work straight away. So since I got up, I dare not think how many blood cells have been made in me. God is always on the job with man. You see, as we sang, he is faithful. This faithfulness is not just to give us life. God sustains life. In us, every second. That's amazing. But we take all these things for granted because we just get on with life. I lifted my arm up and I did that. All the scientists in the world today have spent years in study and have absolutely no idea how I did that. They have no idea how I did that. Almost 60 years, not quite. I'm not giving away Jim Stewart's age tonight. It's in around the same as mine, but it's getting well over the 50s anyway. Look at that. Never had oil on it. Look at that. That thing can work. After 56, 7, 8 years, 9, 60. What is it, Jim? I've lost count. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I think Jim's a week older or younger than me. I don't know what it is. Probably older. I think a week older. I'd say that anyway. <laughs> the complexity, whenever you swallow, they have no idea how that the intensity of requirement of the brain to make the air go into the air and the food to go down the same passage and end up in the stomach, how that that happens. That's so complex. So complex. What is man? Well, man is a very complex creature. That's that's all I'm saying. 
for many years, the, the, the uh, atheists believed that obviously if we came from a cell, if there was a blood cell, then obviously that's a simple, minute thing, smaller than a pinhead. So if we came from cells, cells are pretty pathetic little things. So if there's a blob of them together, man forms, yeah, that's great. But then, then the scientists broke into the cell and they discovered within the cell there are three billion letters that form a library. Every letter in that three billion, uh, those letters that form that cell, if any of them are out of place, then there's big problems for life existing. The complexity, as I say, one cell has three billion letters. Uh, To believe in atheism is essentially to believe that a library fell out of the sky, nobody wrote it, but all the letters in all the books happened to form sentences that were divided correctly, full stops, punctuation was dead correct for you to understand the instruction within all that library that fell from the sky. My dear friends, that, that's how complex man is. The evidence for, for creation is overwhelming. Overwhelming. Now, I'm not here to convince you tonight in belief of God. I believe most, if not all, of you believe in God. But I am here to tell you that don't believe in your own kind of, you know, the ground's not good. <laughs> Scientifically, the ground's very good. And it's getting better all the time for creation. Okay, so man is made, the Bible says, not just with a body, but he has a spirit and a soul. When God made man, he gave him unique abilities. You see, there's something about man in many things, but one in particular that's very unique is that man is creative. He's designed to be creative. You only have to look at our world to recognize when you see the buildings, the bridges, the mile high, you know, these buildings, skyscrapers up into the sky and, and clocks and computers. And I mean, man's amazing. He's amazing. Creative power. This genius in the brain. Where does it come from? Well, of course, he was made by a creator. And the creator has put his imprint on man. We are designed to make. We are designed to be creative. There's some people have creative, especially when it comes to the arts. In regard to either music or art or or fashion or whatever. There's people who have amazing. Then there's people in engineering. And just absolutely fascinating how God makes them all so unique and different. And everybody has creative ability. Made in the image of God, the creator. But not only was man made with creative power. But we have this unique thing and And we carry it about with us, and that is this unique sense of justice. Justice. Whenever you hear that a little child has been molested by a paedophile, if you happen to be normal, and there are many that are not normal, but if you happen to be normal... Your instinct would be that person must be punished if you're normal. My son was telling me the other day, he said, Dad, did you hear about MAP? I says, what in under goodness are you talking about? MAP. They're adding it to the LGBTQ, whatever else, all I don't know. MAP's being added. I said, Daniel, what are you talking about? Minor attractive personality. What? He said they're saying now that there are adults, men, who are saying I am a child trapped in a man's body and I need to be with children. Is pedophilia going to come? Sure it's going to come. Do you think once hell's gratings are opened on a nation that that gratin will close down? Not on your life unless God Almighty closes it down. Hell will just keep pumping out more out of the gratin. It's coming. You say, I don't believe it. Read about the Greeks. Pedophilia was normal in Greek society. 
normal. It's coming, unless God intervenes. Well, that's why I'm asking if you happen to be normal or not. Not everybody's normal today. But there's a sense of justice when you hear someone, a child has been hurt or abused. Now, where did that come from? That sense of right, wrong, punishment, justice. Well, you see, what is man? Man is a creative being, but man has this sense of justice. It can be warped through his own sin, but it's still there. You see, when God made man, God is the, is the mitre, as it were. He's the marker. He's the, he's the stick, the yard that, that places before man. There is a right and there is a wrong. And, and even though people deny God, still they have that awareness that there is a right and there is a wrong. Where does it come? It comes from a God who is right. And even though man is fallen, that mark of God is still there. A sense of justice. Well, my dear friends, not only is man creative, and not only is there a sense of justice with him, but also man is spiritual. Now, this is the most, I find the most uh, obvious of all in relation to people who don't believe in any spiritual you know, you know, you have no spirit. You just die and go to the ground. This, to me, is the overwhelming aspect because even if you turn on your television today, you'll find that most times there's a program on, and what they're doing is they're going into haunted houses. <laughs> these things are moving about, and they're, you know, these people know nothing about God. They know nothing about the gospel. They know nothing about the Bible. But these people are experiencing these things. Oh yes, my dear friends, there's a spiritual world. Make no mistake. There's a spiritual world. It's very real. And you don't have to be a Christian to understand it. But my, there's many, many people, as I say, who believe in God or the gods around the world. They know all about exp- spiritual experiences. Man is spiritual. But the thing about it is, today with all that we have materially, we try to fill that void. There is that belief in our culture that if you get a new house, if you get more money, if you get the big job, if you all your aspirations, if you grab and get them and tramp over whoever you want to get them and you get them, that will be it. You will be satisfied. Of course it's a mirage, it's a delusion. It doesn't happen. I love reading the book of Ecclesiastes of uh, Solomon. Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes primarily from the mindset of of looking at the world through his lens and his experience of life as king. And having come, getting older in life, he looks back and he reviews himself and he reviews life and he comes up with amazing assessments. Amazing. I love reading that book. It starts out with vanity of vanity, meaningless, meaningless. All is meaningless. He tells about all his achievements, all the buildings that he has built. He tells about all his wealth and his gold and all his singers and all his wives and how he gave himself over to every type of pleasure that was possible at that time, even alcohol. And he brought in clowns and and, and comedians. And he tried it all and he said at the end of it, he said it's all vanity. It was all nothing. It was all meaningless. Oh, my friend, the sooner you learn that in life, the better. The meaningless and the emptiness and the futility of this life. We are not designed to be eternally bound to this world and its sin and death. There's something much better and much brighter, and we want to look at that as we come toward the end. Whenever he comes to the end of the book, he says something that I remember first reading it and then I memorized it and I I often think about it. He said, you know, I have, and I'm paraphrasing here, he said, I have looked back over my life as the king, as the greatest, the wisest man that ever sat on the throne of Israel. And he said, I want to give you some advice. Those who, who have read my book, I want to give you some advice. He said, this is 
This is after such a life of luxury, pleasure, wealth, prestige. All, I've had it all. He said, this is my assessment. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's what I've learned. Have you learned that? I need to fear God. That doesn't mean to be frightened of him. It means to be really not wanting to offend him. Not wanting to break his law. Not wanting to disregard his truth. But having a relationship with him wherein I want to maintain the relationship. I want to know his love flowing into my life and that my heart is open to him. I fear him and I keep his laws and I keep his commandments so that that relationship can develop with him. A number of weeks ago, I was, a young lady uh, came to see me. Her, her, her father had rang me and said, I, I, my daughter, I'd love you to talk to her. And so she came along. She had been brought up in a Christian home as a young child, not say what church, but it would have been a good church. But like so often, she didn't see a lot of reality in the home and didn't see a lot of reality of God in the church either. And she thought, is there really much in this? That's a big problem for the church today, isn't it? Young people are gone. The thing that young people will go after is when it's real. If it's not real, even though they go and sit in it and they look the part, their hearts will not be in it. Young people love reality. They love it. They hate anything false. That's a good thing. It's a good thing. So this young girl came along in her early 20s. She said, um, my dad said to come and see you. I said, what can I do for you? She said, well, she said, I was brought up in the church. I got away from God. And yeah, I don't know why, but she says, I got a bit fascinated with you know, charms and and going to psychics. And then she said, I got in touch with them through the internet with, with a witch. And she said, you know, a lot of stuff. I've done this for a lot of times, a lot of times. But she said, what happened was things started to appear in the bedroom. And she said, then this thing began to beat me, hit me in bed, in the bed. Spirit world? Absolutely. Real? Absolutely. I mean, I didn't have to tell that young girl that the devil was real. She's terrified. <laughs> Sat a little while, listened to her story. She told me the things that were happening and how it was attacking her and scratching her. And I said to her, well, what has happened is you have recognized that you're a spiritual being, which is absolutely right. But you've opened the wrong doors and as a result of opening the doors, even though you decided it was just a joke or you decided it was just something to play with, the guy on the other side of the door didn't think that. And so once you opened the door through you doing those things, then he came in and now he's in your bedroom and he has no intention of going. And I want to tell you that if you use any of the supposed methods that these people you've been talking to, whether you put salt in your room or whether you carry different products around with you to supposedly dispose of evil spirits, it's not going to work. But I said, the good news is that, that this can all be dealt with. But there's only one person who can do it. And I said, I can't do it. But there's one person and his name is Jesus Christ, God's son. And if you open your life to him and you ask him to come into your life, he will come in and he'll forgive you for all the sin that you've told me about and all the, all the sin you haven't told me about. And he'll wipe that all away. And if you're willing to get rid of a lot of the old stuff that you have, the books, the things the witches give you, you go out and burn all that, God will clear your room and he'll bring his presence into that room. And that's what she did that night. She called on the Lord to save her come into her life I've seen her two or three times since and she's come and she said the change she said it's perfect peace no noise, no presence, no scratching no thumping, no beating 
She says, I'm so thankful. I said, well, don't thank me. I said, that was Jesus. He's God's son. He defeated the devil on the cross. He rose again. God has exalted him above all principality and power. Oh, my friends, there's a spiritual world. There is a spiritual world. Well, let's look at it quickly. Time's near gone. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. Ah, well, we're going to conclude with that. God visits him. He visits man. Hmm. It's interesting. I looked up that little word in the Hebrew language, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar. Remember a preacher saying, I know a little Hebrew. He says he brushes my shoes, or he cleans my shoes in the evening, and I get him to polish them. That was the only little Hebrew he knew. Well, I'm not unlike him. But you've great helps and aids, internet and all that, and phones. You can look up if you take the time. And there were some very interesting and significant meanings to the word visit. And we're going to look at just a few of them briefly. The first one is, What is man that thou art mindful of, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Ah, God visits man. It means initially to care for. Do you know the Bible says, God makes the sun and the rain to shine on the just and the unjust. He visits him. He visits him. In so many practical ways, God sends gifts into our lives. He looks after us. He provides the food at harvest time. We'll sing about it. It, it just happens. He just does it. He, he visits mankind. And he said after the flood, he said that, that, that though the flood would come, he said, never again while the earth remains, seed to him in harvest. There'll never be another flood of water, never a judgment like that again. He visits. But then, of course, there's that for the Christian, for the person who has, like that young girl, given their life to Christ. Then the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, comes to live inside. And Jesus said when he told the disciples, he said, it is, it is necessary that I leave you. And he knew that they were very sad and he pointed that out. He said, I, I, I see that you're, you're grieved because I'm going. You wouldn't have wanted Jesus to go, would you? After three years of watching and seeing and the miracles, he says, I've got to go. He said, there's a lot of things I have to say to you. But he said, you're not able for them. But he said, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He said, I'm sending, uh, uh, he said, I'm going to the Father and the Father is sending the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And dear friends, those words of Jesus 2,000 years ago became real to me 40 years ago. When I received Christ as my Savior, the Holy Spirit entered me and for the first time I knew Jesus living in me, living in me. And if you know him tonight, he lives in you as well. His spirit lives inside your spirit. And he cares for you. And Jesus said when he was encouraging the disciples to trust in God, he said to the disciples, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything you need in this present life, he will add it to you. He'll visit you. He'll visit you. Let me tell you a little story. During the summertime, one night, I have no idea where I was, and that's very common. My place, even sometimes when I happen to be there, I still don't know where I am. But we were traveling this road, and my wife was sitting beside me, and we were coming from some event. I don't know what it was, but we were coming from something, 
And she was twiddling at the phone. You know the way the wife does that? She's always twiddling on the phone. No? You just don't know that? <laughs> twiddling on the phone. She looked at me and she says, with three pound in the account, I says there'll be no fish supper the night. It's not a good place to be when you've three pound in your account and you've three children like Alsatians and when they put their head into the cupboard there's nothing got, there's nothing left. I said, well, sure, the Lord has been faithful for 30 years now. He has never let us down in 30 years. She will just tell him. So we prayed, left it with him. Next day, next morning, I was down in the study. Ting on the phone, the wee thing ting come on the phone. I looked up and into the account, a thousand pound, into the account. I knew who it was. It was a little church in Wales. A little church in Wales. I know the folk, they're good folk. But there you are, that happened. So the next day I rang and I said, it's just a small church, but they're, they're, they love the Lord. They meet in a home. And they do as much as most big churches put together, to be honest with you. But that's besides the point. But I rang them and I said, listen, I just want to thank you so much for, for sending that to us. You have no idea how God guided you. You have no idea. And I told her the story. She said, well, I want to tell you a story. Go ahead. She said... Yesterday morning, she said that there's a lady who looks after certain parts of the church, which is a great prayer ministry. And she rang me and she said to me, put a thousand pound into Alan and Rachel's account. And she says, do it now. God said, do it now. And I says, well, sure, that's just the Lord, isn't it? I get the money, you get the reward. You'll get the reward. Thousand pounds gone, the reward's stored up. More blessed to give than to receive. That old man I was telling you about that was 106 when he died, I met him one day in his 80s on the bicycle was poor and I threw the bike into the boot. He wasn't the, he wouldn't have been five foot tall. If the wind would have got him, he would have been in Loch Ney. And I got him into the car and drove him home. And he started very well. I knew he was a wealthy man. But he had a bicycle. He didn't have a car. Bicycle. He was 96 or 93. He says, you know, a lot of people you probably have heard said that I'm a very wealthy man. I said, well, actually, I did hear that, that you are a wealthy man. Well, he said, a number of years ago, he said, I made a choice. He says, either I can have it here and enjoy it here and then when I die it's gone or I can send it on ahead and he said I sent it on ahead he'd be enjoying it now you see my dear friends God comes to visit us he visits us Visits us in care. Very quickly, then he comes to visit in judgment. Now, we've read about that, haven't we, and mentioned whenever Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you remember whenever they were having a ball of a time? And if it had been in today's context, all around Sodom and Gomorrah, there would have been flags flying. There would have been parades up and down the street and probably a load of clergymen at the front of it. And they would have been all celebrating and talking about God and talking about freedom, and talking, and all that would have been going up. That was the environment that was in Sodom and Gomorrah. And the angels came and they said to Lot, get out of this place. The Lord is going to rain fire and brimstone. Judgment's coming. There's going to be no mercy, because God couldn't find ten righteous people in the city. 
Abraham has prayed and wept and cried to God that God would spare these people, that God would have mercy on these people, but God couldn't find ten. And now judgment is coming. And my dear friends tonight in the world that we live, if there isn't an awakening that rescues people, then judgment will come. It's as real, it's as obvious, it's as clear to the nature of God as is written in the Bible. God brings judgment on wickedness. Let me tell you another little story, and I promise I'm near over. A number of years ago, a young man from Belfast came to see me in my home. He had become a Christian, but he still had quite serious problems, a lot of issues, really struggling, not making much progress in the Christian life. As we talked at length, he proceeded to tell me that his relatives and some of those in previous generations had been involved in the troubles. And he told me that they had murdered people, The first, some of the first police and army that were murdered. It was his, his family that had killed them. So I said to him, well, we'll pray. We'll pray with you. And when we prayed with that young man, what we noticed was he was a very nice, pleasant fellow, pretty strong, but sitting there, and I started to see his fists going white as they tightened up. And then I began to see his face getting really aggressive, and I knew what was happening that the thing that his family had been involved in, killing and murder, had opened the door to very dark things into the family. That's the awful tragedy. If you live a wicked life, you bequeath it to your children. Tragedy. And this thing rose, and I knew it wasn't him, but what rose in him was an evil spirit. And I said, knowing, I said, what's your name? And it said, murder. But it didn't say it in a nice manner. Murder. I'm in this family. And I'm here to stay. We invited the Lord. The fellow had repented over what the family had been involved in. He acknowledged it and realized it was wrong and ungodly and wicked. And we asked the Lord to come and minister, and suddenly, really quite unusual, it began to shout, I can go now, I'll go now. That's very unusual when you're praying with people that an evil spirit will cry to leave. They generally don't want to leave. But it cried to leave, it really wanted to go. I said, I'm quite curious why you want to go. He said, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. And I said, no, you're not going until I find out why you want to go. I really want to find that out. Why do you, an evil spirit, want to leave this man and you'll probably go either to the waste places or go to the pit of hell? Why do you want to go? And it said something that struck a chord in my heart and it made me so grateful to be a Christian. It cried out, holiness. Holiness. I can feel the holiness of God. I want out. I want out. (laughs) Do you know the Bible says to us who are Christians, God help each one of us, but it says, Be ye holy, even as I, the Lord, am holy. We have to be aggressive with our sin. We have to be aggressive with things that are not right in our lives. Well, my dear friends, he comes to visit with punishment and he judges evil and finally he comes to bestow grace for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich yet for our sake he became poor that we through his poverty might be made rich he comes of course to expose sin he comes to turn us to righteousness there's so much we could say but 
course, I know you're praying for it, and the group I'm with, we are praying for it in our land, in the land of both North and South of Ireland, is what the old saints call heaven coming down. When visitation of heaven in revival comes, the grace of God is manifested. Not to the one or two, not to a little mission here or there, but to a whole community. To a nation that's dark and blind and bound and damned and on its way to hell and doesn't know, depending on religion, priests, ministers, blind leading the blind, all going into the pit, seven million in Ireland. Desperately need the light. Desperately need the Saviour. Desperately need the Gospel. And so it is our duty to pray and to knock and to plead and to call and to live righteously before God and to wait for the wind of God to blow so that grace can be manifested on both our nations in this one island. What is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visitest him? Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your precious word. I pray that the Holy Spirit will take the truths of your word and apply them convictingly and savingly into lives. Lord, we thank you for what you have planned for this island. And we plead again at your throne that you will visit Ireland with revival and that our people will turn to God. Bless this people. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, our brothers, go.